Conley, and I'm doing this presentation with uh, Kate Howes. Um, we are very excited about it. Um, and today we're going to be talking about cooperative learning. Uh, just a couple of objectives. One of the things, just me being a teacher, my life is defined by student objectives and making sure students understand what they're learning and why it's important. So today we'll be defining what cooperative learning is and explaining the five elements that make up cooperative learning, as well as understanding why small groups are necessary and why cooperative learning should be used consistently and systematically. So cooperative learning, like why is this category important? And the book kind of breaks it down into these five buckets. Um, the five buckets being, as you can see, interaction, reflection, motivation, interdependence, communication, and reasoning. Um, they focus on interaction because the students are not, we know that some of the best learning doesn't hype happen in isolation, and cooperative learning gives students a chance to talk with one another, collaborate, bounce ideas off of one another. Um, even with that, one of the things that it also allows is reflection. When, this, when a student has their own thought process, we know that we can kind of be tunnel visioned and say, hey, my way is right, it's my way or the highway. But having, this cooper having cooperative learning groups allows for you to hear somebody else's thought process and begin to see like, well, is, there, is their thought process valid? Is their reasoning sound? Is it something that I could possibly use and add to my thoughts or change my thoughts, et cetera? Um, cooperative learning is a big motivational piece, especially for students who are on both ends of the spectrum. It allows for students who are great leaders to show their leadership skills and pulling people in and bringing people together. It also lets those students or those people who may be quieter to kind of feel involved without so much being in front of the entire group. Instead of them having to stand up and talk in front of the class, they're talking to two, three, maybe four people, which makes them feel a lot better. It develops, it develops interdependence, and interdependence is the sense of understanding that my, what I'm doing matters to the group. Um, co cooperative learning groups, they, excuse me, they make, for, they make for great learning sessions where people understand, like, your thoughts are just as valuable and important as mine and hearing them back and forth develops deeper knowledge about whatever skill that they're learning about. And then it's cooperative learning groups is big for communication and reasoning. We know that as much as technology is changing and growing, that communication and having, having being able to express your ideas is something that's never going to go away. It's something that's always going to be important. Even with all of us in so many different places, we're using this tool to communicate and sharing your reasoning about what is going on and why it's important. So there are five elements to the cooperative learning model. Um, the first being positive interdependence. Um, the book focuses on positive interdependence because we know that if, I'm trying to figure out the, the right way I want to say it, um, some, sometimes cooperative learning groups can have a negative feeling if they're not, if they're not set up and created effectively. Um, one of the things that we do, one of the things that we do at, at my school to develop this is that, hey, everybody, everybody has to have a thought. And even if there's somebody who is kind of sitting to the side, we say, hey, we may have only set a group of two people, but that person sitting to the side, pull that person in. That person now feels a part of the group. They feel valued. They feel like what I have to offer is important. It gives face-to-face face to face interaction. A lot of times students are just sitting there, you know, the, the old school way was they're sitting there facing the board, listening to the teacher, and there wasn't any interaction between, between each other. It gives students a chance to talk a little bit, to share ideas, to gather thoughts, to see things through multiple different lenses. It has both individual and group accountability. Great, Great, co great cooperative learning groups, the individual student will know that these are my goals as well as the goals of the group. 
it, it gives you interpersonal and small group skills, as well as some, <clears throat> excuse me, some group processing, some group, process, group processing goals. And this goes back to that, that reflection. When students are gathering those ideas, they're processing them, is this sound, does this work, does this make sense? One of the things that we do at my school to like make all of this work and make all of this sticky is the first thing we do is we give students wait time. So we'll pose a question, if my number is four, what is the opposite of four? We give all the students think time. Then we start, when I say go, and we give very strong clarifying directions. I should see you talking with your shoulder partner. I should hear mathematical conversation. And then we'll say go. Those students have already had time to think about a possible answer and why their answer's right. They then are turning with that person and they're sharing what they think and hearing what that person thinks. If that person doesn't have anything, they're kind of pulling on that person. Well, what do you think? Well, what do you think about this? Why do you think that? And then when we all come back, we're sharing those thought processes like, hey, when you talked with Susan, Susan said this. Well, why do you think Susan said that? And then students are also, they also get a chance to see like, hey, I had this thought process and I thought that I may have been wrong, but I see that there's now six other people in the room that had the same kind of thought process as me. And then there's, a, there's power in that because kids also get to see like, hey, my thought process, although it may have been different, it still is getting me to the same goal or I'm still moving towards the same learning outcomes as everyone else. So then we will talk about classroom practice. This has to be very deliberate and intentional. You cannot just think that, hey, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and we're just gonna throw, I'm gonna throw these cooperative learning groups together and they're just gonna flow seamlessly. You have to be, just like when you have a meeting, you can make an agenda, you have a classroom and you make a classroom seating chart, you have to be very intentional and deliberate about how it is that you're making this group or you're making this agenda. This way, you know, you already know the questions that students may have or that the people in your audience may have. And as those questions come up, you're already prepared for, hey, how can I, how can I combat that? How can I, how can I defend that? How can I continue to push them in this direction? It also helps because, again, we, we, like I said before, you have those people who are leaders, people who are quiet. Well, I know if I have somebody who's a leader, I may need to have them by someone who's quiet because then they're going to help pull that person. They're going to help pull that person in and make sure that that person is being, is being included. And again, it all goes back to this all builds positive interdependence. Everyone feels connected. Everyone feels valued. Everyone's voice feels heard. Now I'm going to share, shoot it over to Kate. Very nice. Thank you for the coffee break sharing. So I can grab con control, but while that's heads up, uh, one of the things is keeping group size small. I think we've all fallen into that category where you have an odd number of students or there's only so many ways to break people up and you're like, well, you know, it's fine. I'll have a group of six or two groups of, of six. Really should not have to be doing that. Um, the idea is to keep things five and below. So there's actually been studies done on this that the bigger the group, the lower the motivation. You know, oh, the teacher's not going to see what I really have to do. Well, there's not much that I can do, that kind of thing. There's an increased feeling that their actions are going to go unnoticed. So if the teacher's not going to see how awesome my presentation is or my artwork and not know that I did it, why am I doing it? So if you keep it five or below, you really have a better chance at having all of your students shine. And by keeping group sizes small, it's better at limiting social pressures. And this can be a really sensitive thing, especially if you're working with like middle schoolers. They're constantly worried about what other people think of them and what's going on. So by having smaller groups, they feel like they have more of a voice. 
they have an opportunity to share what they're thinking without having the entire class hate them or think they're stupid because it's just a smaller group. Kate, is there any way you can speak up? There's a couple people that are that are having trouble hearing you. Right now it's my mic not working. Can anyone hear me? No, it's working, but it's really low. It's really quiet. Mm -hmm. Let me just try something here. Is that better? I don't know. Um, that's that's fair. Anybody? Yeah? Okay, thank you, Curtis. Hmm. Brenda says she can still not hear me. Brenda, is that still true? You're just, you, you, we can hear you, you're just very quiet. blast right now. You might have to just use your gym teacher voice. Teacher voice. Usually that gets called the drill, drill sergeant voice, but all right. So using cooperative learning consistently and systematically. So basically, when should you be using groups? Every day. That's what one of the points that the book makes. At the very least, once per week. If you want to use more with groups, they don't they say don't go crazy with it. Gradually add more. You don't want to throw a lot of group work at students all at once because one of the important things is you need to maintain balance. Students still need their own time to think and process information, but they can't do that in a group setting 100% of the time. So find a balance between the two. Also, one of the big things is don't make the assumption that students know how to work in a group or how you want them to work in a group. You really need to go through and explain what you want, especially if you're going to start practicing using it every day or at least once a week. How to break people up into groups. There's a couple of ways to do this. Of course, you can do it by random. Start pointing at students, numbering off, hand out cards based on the color of the card or what's on it. They can then get into those groups. You can have some sort of a commonality, like maybe their ability levels. You could have common birth date month, common favorite colors, things like that. There was one note though that Grouping by ability may limit some of the knowledge, experience, and motivation of the students within that group. This is especially true for students who know that they're low performing and they're put with other low performing students, or they're in a, a mixed ability group, but they know that they're that lower uh, experience level. That might hinder some of their intrinsic motivation to want to shine for you. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. They suggest mixing it up. One of the ideas that was interesting to me was actually having like a, a steady group, but then breaking it up every so often. So when you go, all right, get into your seasonal partners, you get in with those partners, but then any other time, maybe you split it up so that not too many personalities get too used to that group. So back to, you can't make assumptions that your students know how to be in a group. Teachers must teach the steps, provide opportunity to practice. So don't throw a major assignment at them and expect it to shine. Show them what the steps in that group would look like. Give them an opportunity to practice where you can then define the norms and provide feedback. So if something's not working, let them know 
and adjust from there before everyone's grades on the line and people are stressing out over it. Is that a little better with the volume? Yeah, you're quiet, but it's much better. Cooperative learning with today's learners. The keystones of preparing students for future endeavors. So we're trying to prepare them for the rest of their lives. A lot of that is work. So they need to know two things, collaborating and creating, like Greg spoke to earlier. Having a structure that provides students with opportunities to work together within the role. So as silly as something like a recorder or a director is in a group and they might look at that title and go, really, we need to? You're giving them those roles to give them a job to practice. They have to meet the deadline. So what deadlines do you set? What do you expect your students to have done by the end of day one, by the end of the week, by the end of the project? Give them deadlines to meet along the way to get a better product at the end. And of course, the actual creation of a product. We do not work in isolation, so the student shouldn't have to learn in isolation. It's one of the points brought by the book. If you can find a job where you don't have to interact with anybody else in any way, it, that would be kind of a feat because even people like my boyfriend who works at home still has team meetings, regular phone calls, emails, and everything else going on throughout the day. So even though he's in the house and no one else is, there is still cooperative practices going on within his department. So having a student sit in their desk single file in the classroom staring at nothing but you and the board, what is that practicing or showing for them in the future? You've got to change that up sometimes. A lot of differentiated learning can come into great with this where you allow multiple opportunities for the students. Use her or are you still there, Kate? I'm still here, but I'm unsure what happened to your screen. I see you. Yeah, I'm kind of. I think that Greg got kicked out. I have it. Do you want me to put it up? Do you have it there, real quick? Somewhere just. Give me two seconds, I guess. Here, hang on one second. I had it open in the background, but not the main tab. And the yeah. Computer's running really slow right now. Am I still in the group? You got to love issues. There we go. You got it? I had to download it from the. The entire Zoom chat window just disappeared from my computer and then came back. Okay. Glitch that's normal, but I thought I'd share that with you. Okay. I think we're better. Everyone can see it. I'll continue yelling if we need to, or does it sound differently now? Hello? Can anyone hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. Sorry, I was looking for feedback just to make sure. Yeah. All right, so some tips for teaching using cooperative learning. First thing that you need to make sure is to really establish a culture for the classroom. That's all about, I used to always call it climate control. How does your classroom run? 
how do you handle disagreements in the classroom and people sharing their opinions? So if you create a culture that supports cooperative learning by being clear with the students about norms and the parameters, so the boundaries of what they're allowed to say and do in certain situations, help cooperative learning take place, but take place as well as it can. Second thing, focus on structures and processes. What kind of structures do you want to teach the students? And how do you want them to follow when they're working in those cooperative groups? And model for students what they should do. Don't just tell them, show them what they need to be doing. Provide help and feedback. I've fallen victim to this once, I'll admit it. I've seen other teachers do it. They set up the groups for students. You give them the computers and you tell them, go to work. Meanwhile, other people are coming in with different tasks for you to complete as a teacher and you're not really there providing help and feedback, make sure you're providing help and feedback for those groups. Even if they don't raise their hand, it doesn't mean that they don't have a question. They are still students. Sometimes they don't want to admit that they don't know. So make sure you still make it a point to go around, help the students out along, provide feedback if you see certain group members or the project going off course of what you would like to see. Ensure it meets a mastery target. Don't just give a group project to give a group project. Make sure that there's a reason for what they're doing and that you share that reason with the students so that they can practice those skills of creating a product well to the best of their ability. Clearly define the goals, tasks, and responsibilities. Make sure that you go through. It was mentioned in the chapter, you know, maybe that takes place as a, an entire day where you go through and you define what the goal is, what the task is going to be, what responsibilities, what should they, what should the project be like at the end. I never keep the hard copies of my students' works, but I would scan them in. So I always had a file um, that I could put up on the board. I just find that easier for me that I, I don't have a lot of paperwork around, but I always have an image that can be shared. And make sure these projects are used to deepen knowledge and be used meaningfully. So yeah, I could have my social studies class look up facts about Argentina, but what are they really using with that information about Argentina? Are they comparing it to what life is like today? Make sure there's something that's, that deepens their knowledge and that they can use the information that they're working together with in a way that's going to help them. Any questions? And right now I can't even see the chat box. So if you have a question, go ahead and just butt in. Kate, I don't have a question, but I just want to say I thought it was really informative um, and it's interesting because I teach at the college level and I admit um, when we do group activities, I often just assume that they know how to do this and I'm realizing now that I probably really do need to set um, clearer guidelines and give them some more um, productive methods to use. So thank you for that reminder. I believe that was Heather talking. If it is. Heather can yep. see in the square. All right. Thank you for sharing that, Heather. Yeah, absolutely. I have to admit, I was working at a school in Southfield that my sixth grade reading level was second grade. And they came in and was like, don't anticipate that these kids had ever done a group project before. And that, that blew my mind. And having the book reinforce it was, yeah, definitely a, a shareable moment for that. Anything else? Anybody else have questions? And I know one of the other things that we do at our school is we'll give kids sentence starters. And so that way, like, whatever the topic is that they're researching, talking about, learning, they have that sentence starter that is like their go-to that they then can springboard off of. Does anyone else want to click in or, or jump in with a question or comment? Okay, a couple of things that I was thinking about as they were as they were presenting. How do you all 
engage cooperation in your classroom, cooperative learning? Do you give a grade for it? Do you just assign points for having it done? Do you have a way that you measure how they've cooperated or collaborated together? I, know I personally know the benefits of collaborative collaboration, but if it's in a graded situation, I hate it. Absolutely hate it. And so do all my kids. So I wondered if you have any strategies to share. I'm sorry. Now I, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Hmm. A louder, Kate. Can you hear me at all? I can hear you. Okay. So what I said, I'll lean in close. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, a bit. Kinda? Ooh, okay. Zoom's all having right. issues today. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's Zoom or if it's me. Personal, personal user use was me earlier. So um, what I was saying is how do you manage the, the collaboration or cooperation in your classrooms? As a group, you guys have a lot of expertise. Even those of you that do not work in a um, school situation, you probably have it worse because I know training adults, getting them to work together and not just chit chat or you know, do their own thing is often really difficult. So do you have rubrics? Do you set rules as they were talking about through the book? How do you manage this in your classroom? Ooh, that's really great. Um, one of the first thoughts that came to my mind is when you were referring to, you know, working it with other teachers. I find sometimes teachers can make some of the worst students take me to a painting with the twist class and I'm sitting there going, I need a ruler, otherwise I can't do this. And there's in there, you'll be fine. Um, one of the main things that I like to do is build relevance. So if you're working with teachers and sometimes there's a lot of changes going on where I am, you bring it back. What's the most relevant thing to a teacher? It's for the kids. I'm doing this for my students to better them. And when you kind of get out of everyone on board with the goal, the end goal, who you're serving, I find you get a lot of buy-in. Um, I know you know through my reflections, I'm working with a group of girls that I've known since they were kids who are also all gymnasts. So I'm getting a lot of buy-in by relating it to their interests. You can't do that with every group project, but by giving them a piece of something that they can pick on. So you give them a chart, a menu. All right, we're gonna do this kind of project. Here's your menu of topics. As a group, come up with which one you would like to talk about and give them some of that ownership and it creates some of that buy-in. I think Kurt, I think Kurt um, just brought up a really interesting point as well. He said he's the quiet person, for those of you that can't see the chat. Um, he's a quiet person, he thinks they're gonna yell, get yelled at, so he's always quiet and gives everyone his attention. How do you deal with a group project with a student like that as well? How do you make sure that they are contributing to it? And this can be, anybody can jump in on this. It doesn't have well, to be our content experts this week. Well, I, I, I'll jump in real quick. One of the things that we do at, at my school is like we have these things called stop and jots. And a stop and jot could be simply like your thoughts, or it could be like what was, what was something that your teammate said that was valuable. And on this paper, it may have four different stop and jots at different questions. And your goal is to try to get some, each person's thoughts on one of these stop and jots. And then that's another way where it shows like everybody was working and participating and sharing their thoughts and their ideas. Anyone else? Since you're conscious of this, Curtis, how do you manage it with your students? I do quite a bit of things. Um, I know I have a lot of students because I'm at the third grade level who uh, they struggle. I mean, I always seem to have like that looming presence, especially at the beginning of the school year, and they're kind of afraid to say something because they're afraid I'm going to yell at them. And I don't know why. So I always try to foster a nice, you know, relaxing community. If students are afraid to speak up and someone does say something that other people agree with or something, just nonverbal signals like something like this, like I agree with you, kind of helps people say, okay, these other people are agreeing with me, I feel better, and they don't have to even raise their hand, just nonverbal signals. I even will say too, after someone says something that I really like, can someone repeat or rephrase what they were saying just so people know that they're speaking, that other people are listening to them. 
but they're not just saying something and then they think no one else is paying attention to them. So uh, as someone who doesn't really like to talk a whole lot, I would probably benefit from like the nonverbal signals or something like that because I'm a big introvert. I like to just kind of sit back and look at things. I would try to fill out those kids and just see how they're doing. And usually when we're in a group setting too, when I assign groups, I kind of make them like the, the logger who will write down the ideas so that they can still be a participant, but not really be a person who wants to speak so they don't get so afraid of, you know, speaking with them. So that's something that I do. And we have a comment. We have a comment over here that says about having um, them fill out a peer evaluation report um, so they can kind of gauge who contributed or not. And um, somebody else said the great idea with the log. You guys are giving me lots of good ideas. I miss being in the classroom and like playing with these things with four kids. So this is awesome. I'm really enjoying this class and you. So a bunch of you do peer evaluations. Okay. Um, which brings up peers. My last little comment to, to bring out to the group for you to think about and kind of talk about if you have ideas. Um, how do you do your grouping? I know there's a lot of research that looks at letting students group with people that they know because of the comfort factor, but there's also a lot of research that talks about intentionally grouping by ability levels, intentionally grouping by other factors. What do you think? I don't have a right or wrong, I'm just wondering. For me, when I, like tomorrow I'm going to be DRA testing my students to see what grade level they're at so I know how to, you know, work with their uh, zone proximal development. For reading groups, I at least try to pair them up around their level because in the past couple of years I found that that works pretty well. They can read the same kind of books and kind of learn from each other. If I'm doing a different kind of, you know, real quick group, especially for math or certain groups, I will pull sticks randomly. And I feel like that works pretty well too. Or I'll just go down the student list. I'll do like numbers one and 30, two and 29 and so on from there. Just to try to keep things random. Because I found in the past if students work with their friends, they're not going to get all the work done. You have some groups that will just sit there and talk the whole time. You have other groups that will actually get their stuff done. But yeah i i don't know i always i always hear different things too and i always feel like i'm not doing it correctly so if anybody else has something to, to share with that that'd, that'd be awesome i don't know that there's a right or wrong there are are right strategies for different situations in different groups in my opinion um heather tossed into the chat um about mixing it up doing it randomly sometimes mixing with different people that have different skill sets um Anybody else, especially those of you that aren't K-12, because sometimes you can learn from the K-12, we've got lots of us in here to do that. But um, for those of you that are in the corporate world or the you know, more business world or in the higher education, sometimes you'll have ideas that other people haven't thought of either. So anyone mm -hmm. else want to share? Yeah, Curtis kind of jogged a memory for me when I taught um, fifth grade. I did the stick, I had sticks with their names on it, and I would just pull them out and call that person to answer the, answer the question. And I did end up pulling out the quiet kid, and it actually got to be fun because they were like waiting to see whose name was going to be called next. And I find that in, in my profession now, that just by asking different people questions, they, they, like, they like being able to respond. So that's kind of all I wanted to share. It's been a while since I've taught, but that was really a cool memory. Oh, I'm glad I got to do that for you. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else have anything like that? Uh, I have a comment about the grouping. Last year with my eighth graders, we did a combined group project with the science class. And the science teacher and I were very intentional with who we grouped uh, with each other, who would work well, who needed more support. But we also created a group, for lack of a better term, of slackers. So they were forced to do work. So we put them in one group uh, so they would have to do the work and could not rely on those students that go above and beyond. They don't care about the shoes, Kelsey. 
if you didn't, if, for those of you that can't see the chat, Kelsey said she takes the left shoe and makes them find their partner. Having taught a lot of ninth grade boys, sorry yeah. guys, I'm not slamming you or anything, but ninth grade boys shoes, <laughs> I wouldn't want that. That's same, a cool idea. It's the same in third grade too, especially in the spring or the summer when they get done playing after recess. <laughs> that's a great idea though. All right, so that's true. Middle school is smelly. Um, I have dropped a link in there um, and I'll put it into the classroom as well. This is the document I was building off of last week that is a Google Doc that has some technologies for collaborative or cooperative learning in it built in. You guys are getting the double dip on this stuff this time. I'm sure you've already seen most of these, but um, last time I said about um, Flipgrid and you, I didn't give you one and so I use it for my other classes. I don't know why I didn't put one in on here. So in there, there is strategies for cooperative learning or collaborations way down at the bottom of like page two. But I do want to show you a Flipgrid um, just to let you guys see it. And if this is a new tool. It is free. You can pay for um, a few extra privileges, but they give this to you free. Um, the one classroom of it, you, you have to run all of your classes through one grid, which I don't have any problem doing that. Um, and you get more time and more responses. I'm putting the code for this one in there as well. Um, and then I'm going to share a screen really quickly. And then I'm going to get you guys out of here. I promise. Okay, so... This is a Flipgrid, and this is my introductions for one of my classes. And um, this is not very nice of me. I'm giving them to you without you being in the class. But you can see, hopefully you can see. Um, this is an introduction for the class that I was teaching. 16 people have posted a video. 31 replies, 287 views, six and a half hours of engagement, basically. Oh, this is you guys. You did see Flipgrid. You told me you hadn't. I was wondering, I was thinking that looked like somebody I recognize right there, and I'm staring right at Michelle. And <laughs> All right, so that's Flipgrid. You've seen Flipgrid. Um, it's pretty awesome. Did any of you make yourself an account? No? It's free. I, don't, I show you only things that are free or else I note that it's not free in parts of it. You can use this for building community engagement, answering questions, video. Um, for, I think it was Kate that said earlier, some of her students only read at a second grade level before, if you can have them verbalize their responses into there, um, it makes it a lot easier and nicer um, for them at times. Not every time, but sometimes. There's a couple of things here. Um, there's Padlet. Have you guys seen Padlet? Okay. So Padlet is like a, a sticker board kind of thing. If you have a link that you want to share, you just come on here, double click. Um, just putting a dock on there, and I'm going to click my little plus in the center, putting in my address. I can choose a file, take a photo, anything like that. Oops, I did do wrong. And it posts it on there. Um, so this is a really great place for like almost like a um, entry board for people to put a lot of resources on and you can set it like this one is set that anyone that accesses it can add things to it They don't have to have a login or anything like that So it's not that you have you don't have to make your students account and all that kind of thing So it's just another really neat little collaborative like researchy um, or resources Sharing place there's other ones in there if you have any questions you can ask about them I can talk you through any of these ones that are listed there are plenty of collaborative tools. If you look online, um, you just do a Google search. Yeah, Class Dojo is really good too. Socrative is nice um, as well. It does kind of the same thing. But all of these tools, um, you're welcome to add them to the, the um, Google Doc that's there. It's set for edit. You can go in and just put, put anything in there that's relevant, um, add them to it, and then you can keep the address for that and the next time you need a tool, you can pull that out and you have that whole list of resources for technology to support it as well. Okay, does anybody have any other questions? Hey, thank you, Greg and Kate. That was a really great way to 
um, get us going tonight and go through the material. I really appreciate that, especially with some technology issues, even for me. <laughs> for those of you that weren't in here earlier, I had my sound turned off on my computer, which I never do. And I told Greg, sorry, now you have to I told Greg that he didn't have any sound on, so I kicked him off, made him go reboot his computer, and it was me. So thank you for being a good sport for those of you that I kicked out of here earlier tonight. All right, if there's no other questions, I will see you guys back here next week. Feel free to email me or, or anything if you have issues or questions, and you have a great night.